I'd like to introduce our keynote presentation, which will be delivered by Rita Rigo, who's here with us today. Rita is a self-described AI enthusiast. She passionately believes in the potential of AI to deliver good for society. And in fact, she believes AI is going to help solve humanity's problems and some of its greatest challenges, from administrative burdens to productive challenges, even climate change and food supply issues, not to mention enabling better customer service and decision making. Rita's AI love affair, if I can call it that, <laughs> started many moons ago during her role at Microsoft and has kicked into high gear in her current role as a strategic manager, uh, sorry, strategic engagement manager at CSIRO's National AI Centre, where she's helping to build out a responsible AI network. It's a world-first, cross-ecosystem collaboration, and it's aimed at establishing and sharing the best practice of responsible AI in the commercial sector. Rita has advised many on how AI and ML can apply to multiple industries, including transport, education, and urban planning, and has worked with organizations on proof of concepts, horizon roadmaps, and partnerships. You'll learn this morning how excited she is about technology and AI in particular, in the opportunities and in the challenges it presents to us today. So please join me now in welcoming Rita Arrigo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank there you, you go. <laughs> Thank you for the great intro. Thank you. Um, thank you for a great intro, and I'm so excited to be here at The Edge. It's been so long since I've made it here. Um, but today I'm going to take you on a bit of a journey on leading innovation responsibly in the race for AI. We're going to cover off um, with the Responsible AI Network. I'm going to talk a little bit about the way um, AI-enabled business opportunities are out there. I'm going to try and break down all the amazing things that Brid Bridget said I believe in around you know, the effective use cases in customer experience, in generative AI. We're also going to look at strategies for um, investments in AI and in the um, bias and bringing in AI at scale, and just really talk about who is going to lead responsible AI, what is, the, what is that leadership look like. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm actually an early adopter of the of bleeding edge technology, starting out in the floppy disk age, um, where I started working with people, you know, moving them from typewriting to computers as in PC support, through to discovering the internet at Australia's first internet cafe, and then joining Telstra when you know the internet was called the Big Pond. It was a weird time back then, <laughs> but, um, but as as you know, I've joined joined Microsoft and really got into the whole digital UX side of things. And, and um, one of my and as a digital advisor there, I got to do a lot of work across a range of different um, industries. But the one that I really embraced was being able to look at the way that AI could really support um, people who were in accessibility, so people in the low-sided space. So it really made me understand the possibilities of what was possible. I got an AI education during... Um, judging the Women in AI Awards. And I did that for two years, I did it this year as well. And it's just amazing to see the different lens that women bring to AI and the kind of things that they were looking to invent and do and that were successfully delivering. Uh, and so that's really opened up, uh, for me, this whole idea of like really embracing diversity at scale in, in, in AI. Um, and so this year I launched the together at the National AI Centre with a range of different knowledge partners, the Responsible AI Network. And that's been super exciting because it's really about democratising responsible AI and being able to make it available to um, everyone in the commercial industry. So a little bit about the National AI Centre. It's funded by the Australian Government, coordinated by CSIRO and supported by our partners, Google and CEDA. But we're, we're basically trying to um, uplift Australia's responsible AI advantage uh, across industry and also build an AI industry in Australia using responsible AI. Um, and so the National AI Centre is doing that across three pillars. From getting started, we're doing a lot of work in educating the community about AI, 
through to getting connected, so making it available and showing people that you can actually buy AI from Australian companies. So we have an ecosystem portal that um, actually promotes a whole lot of the Australian AI companies that are out there, and I'm going to talk about some of them today. Through to uplifting your practice with responsible AI, where I've been working extensively uh, this year. Um, and so where are we at the moment? Where are we today? Well, there's this accelerating AI wave. I, I, Bridget, Bridget really made us feel that today. Uh, but there are all these concerns around you know, trust, privacy, security, and data quality. But um, we see the potential of AI. It's really being able to alleviate some of these um, challenges from health to the environment to societal innovation. But how do we do it with all this complexity and everything generating data? And so that is the opportunity for responsible AI. I don't know how many of you guys have seen this, but these are the key megatrends that um, CSIRO has identified. So we're seeing things like the challenges that we have in our society around adapting to climate change, leaner, cleaner, greener, the health imperative. There just are not enough doctors to deliver health the way we're delivering it today. And we really see AI as having the ability to be our co-pilot in these challenges. Um, so over the last, so not, but the thing is that you know we do need responsible AI. This is actually a really interesting story. This is Nat, this is this story is I found it on LinkedIn. It's Natalie Kurakeo. She's a green activist, and um, she wanted to get herself an avatar, just like it was really cool. Let's get an avatar. Um, but she noticed that when she put her stuff in, it came back with fairies and Tomb Raider and naked women, whereas when men put it in, it was astronauts and scientists. So you really start to see that, you know, that there is a lot of um, kind of uh, bias in some of the data. We also saw people like Microsoft actually take their uh, facial recognition software off the market because people were using it in a way that was not aligned to their responsible AI principles. Uh, we've also seen a heaps of press around you know, the challenges around chat GPT. So this is the opportunity to start thinking about how do we implement responsible AI. And it is really interesting because in a recent study done by IBM in just in 2002, it was established that organizations are not cultivating trustworthy AI. 74% are not reducing unintended bias. 52% are not safeguarding data privacy. We've seen that through some of the data hacks that we've heard about over the past few years. 68% uh, are not tracking performance variations and model drift. It's a really important thing to keep checking your models and make sure they're working appropriately. So there's a, there's a lot of work to be done, and I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of new learnings uh, to, to be done in this space. So let's talk a little bit about responsible AI. So responsible AI was um, one of these areas that Australia was a leader in amongst the leaders in, in, in the world. We established our own AI ethics principles in 2019, and they are things like human societal environmental well-being, human-centered values, fairness, privacy protection and security, um, reliability and safety, transparency and explainability, contestability and, ac and accountability, all big words. But I think what's really exciting about the fact that we have these AI ethics principles is it's now we have to find a way to put them into, into place. And how do we put them into practice? So we've been doing a bit of work around thinking about this, and we've just launched a paper, actually, that takes you through how to implement these principles. And I'm going to just be doing a bit of a summary around this paper. But I want you to note the many personas in AI solutions. So you'll see the one with the code, that's like the development team. So you'll see an infographic where there'll be specific things that the development team are responsible for. And then you'll see the key, and that's like the person that owns the, the system. And you'll see certain things that the system owners are responsible for. And then you'll see this like little box with the little people underneath, which are the senior managers, senior directors, the CEOs. Um, and that's the kind of, and you'll see that they also have responsibility. Um, and you, we'll, we'll, we'll We'll walk through it and we'll make some conclusions around it once we're done. So the first step is around, you know, human societal and environmental well-being. And this is where you'll see you've got a few system owners there around um, and developers around eliciting the potential impacts, thinking about how to assess those impacts and setting ethical objectives. 
So this is where the system, the system um, owner can't really take these tasks on their own. They have to rely on diverse perspectives and expertise, consulting affected stakeholders, consulting the users. Kind of sounds very similar to user experience for those of you who may have done user experience here in the audience, um, where you you went down and you you looked at a broader set of challenges and you tried to find out you know different stakeholders did brainstorming etc. Um, I'll give you an example. For example, um, you might have facial recognition in an airport. Um, so. There might be an air traveler that may be considered, um, wants to know how the data is stored. So could this be remediated by providing signage about facial recognition? There could also be people that wear head coverings that may want to um, not be inconvenienced by the situation. So could there be a way of designing it so that they can have a much better experience? So it's these kind of things that you have to think about in terms of this getting this area happening. Then there's the um, design the human-centered values, so design for human and that autonomy, achieve ethical outcomes, and incorporate diversity. And I love the last one, incorporate diversity, because it's got the little managers and senior directors involved. And this is a really important part of what, what you, we're doing in Responsible AI, is to like look beyond the people who are developing the system and look to you know, extending it out to other stakeholders and making sure you have this whole diverse stakeholder uh, as well as diverse people in your team. Um, so that's a little bit about those selective practices. Let's talk a little bit about some tools. So um, ThoughtWorks has got a whole responsible tech playbook. So you can start to look at things like the ethical canvas, which is a great thing to begin to brainstorm around how are you doing it and which, which parts of the areas of your solution will be affected. Through to things like the um, responsible strategy, the agile threat modeling, uh, and the I really like the unintended consequences where you can really think about what could possibly happen. There's also a tarot card of tech where you can go through and brainstorm exercises and be able to establish um, outcomes and, and different unintended co consequences and opportunities from that. And it's interesting because ThoughtWorks had a really good idea, but CSIRO is also working on a responsible AI board game. So we're going to be sitting around playing these games for a while. But, uh, but I think it's important because you need to get your senior people involved. And this is a great way to kind of engage um, the non-technical. So let's talk a little bit about fairness. Um, privacy, protection, and security. So fairness is an interesting area, and you know there's a lot of different um, solutions in that that allow you to make, make sure that your, your data is actually working in a fair way. So Microsoft FairLearn has been really successful in that space. And in the area of privacy, protection, and security, um, I love this idea of minimizing the collection of personal information. A and so really to, to take that forward and try to find ways that you can do that. Um, so that, and you, I, I, know, I noticed even in art galleries today, if they're taking your photo and using them to you know, develop other components, it will have a little sign that says, we will only keep your data for 24 hours. So a lot of these kind of um, commitments to the way you collect your data are super important. And finally, reliability and safety and ways that you can curate data sets and conduct pilot studies to ensure that the data is aligned, it's got all the, all the appropriate um, biases around and lack, you know, the type of reliability that you're looking for and the kind of results that you're looking for. So that's where you're really monitoring and evaluating continuously to make sure you're getting the right results. And the last one around um, transparency and, and explainability where you can make appropriate disclosures. Um, and this is actually a really interesting um, one, tra transparency and explainability. For example, uh, and I'm going to talk about Snapchat a little bit more later, but for example, they have their AI buddy, and it's been really confusing for some of the young people that use Snapchat, and they, were, they weren't sure they were actually talking to a real person or an AI. So making it clear about you know, who you're actually communicating with and what they are is super important. That's part of this um, uh, making appropriate disclosures. 
Uh, and ThoughtWorks also has a great, another great tool that can really help with that side of things. It's called the ThoughtWorks AI Design Alignment Analysis Framework and allows you to look at it from three lenses. From a technical inf function, like what, does it, what, you know, what was it designed to do? From a communications function, what do people, what are you communicating that it can do? Through to a perceived function, what do people think it's going to do? Uh, and, and I think it's these lenses that you need to look at and ensure that there's no misalignment between them and that they're aligned. And so that will help with a lot of that um, fairness. And finally, we're going to just look at contestability and accountability. So contestability is that, um, that whole ability that you can actually understand what, what is inside that black box. You know, computer says no is not enough. So you need to be able to break that down and know where those decisions have come from and have some kind of system in your organisation around that to understand that your contestability, contestability obligations. And through to accountability, um, probably my favourite because it's in this accountability area that it's up to directors and senior leaders in organisations to raise the awareness of responsible AI within their organisation. And it's really interesting, as I talk further about standards, you'll see that as the AI management standard is launched later this year, it will be um, a, a recommendation and probably compulsory as part of the standard that you have a responsible AI champion in your organisation, someone that's thinking about all these different elements to ensure your AI is behaving responsibly. Okay, so I'm going to briefly just mention the responsible AI network. You can actually sign up. Um, our aim is to democratise a lot of this information that's coming to us about responsible AI, and we're doing it across a range of pillars from law, uh, standards, design, leadership, principles, technology and governance. And we've signed up a range of different knowledge partners, and you'll see us do webinars, um, different content. So these are all available to watch. Um, introduction to Responsible AI Engineering, Introduction to Standards. We did a big responsible operation of, of um, Generative AI. We also have one coming up on Thursday where we're going to really break down that report that I went through briefly. So this will be an hour-long session and it will give you a lot more details on how to implement those AI um, ethics frameworks into your organisation. Um, so stay tuned for that one. So let's talk a little bit about AI-enabled business opportunities. So we are looking at, you know, really building up Australia's AI capability in these five key areas. Health and medical, uh, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, I think there's a lot of work to be done in that space, infrastructure, and our whole future cities, the whole, um, you know, intelligent infrastructure, advanced communications, there's all that work happening in 6G, I'm so excited, <laughs> um, and agriculture and food. But um, I wanted to show you one specific video, just show you the kind of stuff that's happening at the moment in our land and our biodiversity. I know I'm a proud Larrakia man and I work here in Kakadu as a cultural heritage officer. Our country and traditional owners have always been connected. We have gathered knowledge across the seasons to listen to the country. We need to find the best ways to care for the land using our knowledge and new learnings. Magpie geese are an indicator of the health of our country. Watching the patterns of the geese, they tell us where extra care is needed. A dense weed called paragrass is overrunning wetlands and destroying where magpie geese live. We're using drones to monitor parts of the wetlands. They help us see the areas of the park which need our key. We're combining this information with our knowledge, mockers of AI and science to change the way we work on the ground.
It's showing us new ways to manage wetlands and help the magpie geese thrive. With this information in our hands, traditional owners can be front and centre in decisions made about country. Every day, we work to look after Kakadu. We're making sure it's here for future generations. It's, it's an amazing story and it started um, back in 2019 and now we have a whole lot of different Indigenous rangers using the Healthy Country AI to solve some really big challenges in biodiversity. So the other thing that's been happening beyond <laughs> Kakadu and the peace we just felt is this crazy stuff that's been going on with AI. So we all know that it's been going since the 60s and you know people were doing hard maths problems back then and there was a lot of AI going on, but then it really went mad in the second wave when we started to look at all the big data and we were able to actually pull data in and we didn't get stuck in lifts anymore because you could predict that the lift was going to fail and a lot of these kind of things that you know we really take for granted now. But then generative AI exploded and that has been quite a journey for a lot of people and I think it's been super exciting to see people actually notice AI through that process. But I'm going to break down Gen AI a little. Um, what's really interesting about Gen AI is that 30% of professionals have used Gen AI, uh, have used that stuff like chat GPT at work. Um, I want to get a bit of a hands up moment happening here. Who here has used chat GPT? Oh my God, it's like 100%, it's fantastic. <laughs> right. um, so, but 68, apparently 68% 68 of us haven't told our employers that we're using it. Uh, so it's, it's super interesting because I know even at CSIRO, we've been told to be very careful in the way we use it and not to put corporate information in there. So there is a real bit of work to be done in the way we use Gen AI in our work. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, where did it happen and how did it, how did it just come onto the scene. So a lot of data, a lot of people in this space see it as an evolution, not a revolution. Um, one that, and it started with the transformer, which is like a neural network architecture, which was the dominant machine learning stuff that we were all using. It's not named after Optimus Prime, rather the transformer model is named after machine translation to transform from one sentence to the other. And it's the T in GPT. So the first transformer model was called BERT, and at that time in 2018, there were so many different events for BERTology. Um, but now there's a new class of a transformer model and one that generates text, and that's the G in ChatGPT. And these were the early adaptive models that you may have heard of the chatbot Tay that became quite abusive. Um, that's because he was being trained by the users. So the next iteration of of this was the pre-trained model, and that's the P in ChatGPT. And I, I'm sure maybe some of you have heard about the work that was being done in Kenya to clean up all the data sets that were being used in that pre-trained model. And so that's what makes it so friendly and easy to use. It's these three key, key areas. Um, and, you know, we, we have been experienced certain things that can go wrong. So, um, Three key areas, things like bad behaviour, where, you know, it was identified that it was, it was threatening to kill someone, uh, through to unreliable bear, but where chat GPT actually invented a harassment scandal um, that had never happened because a lawyer was actually using it to research a case, through to um, a Samsung employee actually putting code into chat GPT and leaking a whole lot of data about a newer OS, uh, and that was a real challenge for them because that's part of their significant IP. So um, what we're finding is that it's, it's because of the key properties of large language models, like the loosely created data set that we talked about, the natural interface, the wide range of potential behaviours, and the computing intensity of it, that you're getting these kind of risks the harmful behaviour, the unreliable output, and the privacy and security exposure. So what can you do? Um, you can have a look at this great report called Gen AI Governance, How to Reduce Information Security Risk. It's actually issued by ThoughtWorks, and they've been doing things around, you know, um, how to do prompt data and public data and personal data, and how to 
reduce those risks in the security space, as well as um, other key mitigation. So that's a great, great one to, to download and check out. Um, you can also um, start to think about, you know, all the other innovations that are happening in generative AI. So it's not just um, ChatGPT and OpenAI, Google's also going to be launching their new Gemini, which is coming up in December, and it's going to not just do text, but it's going to do text, audio, video, and images. And um, imagine you want to know something specific, and it will actually search a YouTube video and give you that YouTube video to show you how to actually do it. So it's going to be super exciting, and they've merged two, um, two different um, AI groups to form um, Gemini, so watch out for that one. But also Google have today launched um, BARD, which you can use, and that doesn't just use a pre-trained model, it uses all the data on the internet. And they've also launched these Gen App Builder tools, which make it really easy for you to build um, generative AI into your platform, as well as Adobe and what they're doing with Firefly, which is coming out, where you can talk to Photoshop rather than having to know how to use it. Um, so super, that stuff is super exciting. And I did mention, want to mention that you know, ChatGPT is available to us in a range of different flavors. So you can actually access it through Snapchat, um, through the AI Buddy, and that's, it's been super popular. And it, just last week, it actually went a bit crazy and started posting pictures of um, the ceiling and all these kind of stuff, and no one knew what was going on. Um, so it's interesting. Um, and it, they've also had a lot of scandal around you know, the confusion as, it ent as the AI Buddy ends enters chat rooms and people don't know it, it's AI. But I think what Duolingo have done is pretty amazing. So they've made it much more um, real for you as you're learning a language that you can actually enter a cafe and you can be speaking French and actually will generate all the stuff that happens to you in a cafe or it happens to you in an airport. So it's really exciting to see these things being put into our very common apps. We're also seeing people taking the Gen AI concept and making it available in an enterprise way. So ThoughtWorks has recently launched BoltWorks, which is using the Microsoft Azure OpenAI service. Um, so you're not actually using ChatGPT, you're using a very similar service, but in your own private cloud. And they're extracting and generating structured data from unstructured text of jobs and job applications, and then it uses this AI AI-powered machine engine um, that makes the recruitment process much faster and, it, and it's increased the satisfaction of um, the uh, automating these tasks and um, enticing them to focus on higher value tasks. So amazing to see that this stuff is happening in the, in the enterprise space, as well as people like AWS have launched um, Amazon Bedrock. And so this is going to have the ability to you know, I want to explain my back, my, I want to exchange my black shoes for a brown pair, and it will actually automatically do all that for you and uh, go into a back end system, look at the foundation model, provide the relevant information, and then call a set of APIs. So these are the kind of customer services interactions I'm craving for because we don't want to be on hold for these boring things anymore. Uh, <clears throat> So let's talk a little bit about um, some more use cases in customer experience for generative AI. Uh, this paper's just come out. Actually, it was put together by the Tech Council of Australia and Microsoft. And it shows five key ways that generative AI is already being used in organizations. Starting off with a developer that's been using generative AI for coding um, as a coding companion and getting 50% less time then saving tasks, 56% time that people are not using Gen AI. The creative, who's actually using it to help with copy, and they're already finding that 40% of the creatives are using, 14% are using generative AI in their work. Um, the salesperson, who is using generative AI for customer service interactions. Uh, the manager, who's using it to write better better stuff, uh, and through the researcher. This is super exciting what's happening in the research space and AI and in discovery with AlphaFold predicting the 3D coordinates of over 375,000 protein structures. This is having a huge impact on the stuff that we're doing in biology. 
And let's look at it from a lens of accelerated computing. So Generative AI Foundation, they're finding that enterprises that adopt next generation AI like large language models and generative AI are 2.5 times more likely to increase their revenue and have 10% more um, but, must, but they have to invest in their AI infrastructure and the way they think about it. So I, I look at um, three key areas, the language, biology, and visual design as areas of major innovation. Um, so this is actually from um, NVIDIA. And they have been doing a lot of work around the guardrails that are required for your large language models. And their product is called Nemo. And what it does, it actually provides um, safety that prevents some of these hallucinations. You may have heard that Gen, Gen AI does. Um, it also provides security around preventing you know, malicious attacks, as well as focusing on interactions in a specific domain. And um, ServiceNow have just deployed this. So now when you're using ServiceNow, which I think a lot of us have to use, um, it will actually summarize and find knowledge base articles and give you a lot more information than what it's doing, uh, what it, than what we're previously used to. Another area that I think is super exciting, because you know, art and artists you know, and copywriters, very talented. And so what we're finding is that you know, people who don't have those skills are able to use generative AI. But we still need to protect the rights of our artists. Um, so Getty Images is recently launched a generative AI platform that is actually using fully licensed um, images. So is Shutterstock. And Shutterstock is looking at more of a 3D version of that. And um, I really love this story. This is... Um, came out by WPP, and they're actually using a generative AI model to um, generate this car. But what they actually did is they, they, um, they basically framed it in a digital twin so that the generative AI could actually help to generate these, this particular um, car by connecting the data sets from a range of ecosystems. So super wild, the kind of creative stuff you can come up with. Um, and so check out that case study online for more details. Um, I wanted to just touch on the metaverse uh, just because I think... You know, we've forgotten about it, and I think it's still something that is super exciting, and it's coming our way. Um, and we've seen it in gaming. You know, we're really seeing, you know, talk about the generative AI in gaming and what, what's going on in that space. And you can look up Voyager and what they're doing in Minecraft with a range of different uh, generative AI capabilities through to what's happening in the enterprise, to what's happening in the industrial, but also what's happening in the meta metaverse. So you'll see a lot of people using um, the kind of holographic computing and the ability to holo, holo presence in and be able to, you know, and moving that to AI where the AI can actually recognise what's going on. So a, a key example of this is this is some of the work that CSIRO is doing in the digital human ergo mechanic. It actually uses a 3D biomechanical model of a human. And you'll see that's me holding a little box. But what it can actually do is it can calculate how heavy that box is and whether I'm going to hurt myself by lifting it. And this is super exciting for making workplaces safer because you can imagine that you can take that kind of data, overlay it in a bio, biomedical, in this biomedical ergomechanic algorithm and be able to really understand what's happening to the human body in these situations. Uh, they learned that from sports, so they learned it from swimming um, and... Um, diving and different different techniques, but it's a super exciting um, tool that you, we can take to, to, to the market. Um, as well as, um, this is actually a clinical simulation. So we, we don't have enough people to train nurses. So this is using a digital human to train people nursing in a holographic environment. Now that digital human used to have like you know, the same words that would come out of the digital human. So what they're actually using now is generative uh, AI or chat GPT. So it becomes more real, and that experience becomes more real as, you, as you're training on that uh, digital human. Um, it's also being used in a range of other 
areas around task guidance. So this is actually a Victorian company called Bologram that has used the um, mixed reality to create the ability to lay bricks without having to do string, etc. cetera, um, through to being able to look at a showcase, through to training and simulation, and of course, the work in healthcare. But I just want to show you this. So this was actually built for the Talon Architectural Biennale using the Fologram software. So what would have taken months became weeks using that kind of technology. So it's super exciting to see what's possible out there as we start to use these more immersive technologies. So let's talk a little bit about um, strategies for AI at scale. Um, and um, this is what I was talking about with the Australian AI industry. So we have a whole list of different companies who are doing work in AI across Australia. ThoughtWorks obviously is one of them. And um, we're, we're uh, so let me talk about a couple of them. One of the first ones I love is Aparte, which means it's, it's the god of deception. And this was, came out of Macquarie University. It's actually using generative AI to combat phone scamming, which I think is amazing revenge <laughs> and, and, and making a really big difference to those, to, you know, to people who are tortured by those kind of phone calls and, and you know, have a lot of time wasted. Um, through to Sapia AI, who actually here in St Kilda, and um, Barb has worked with a psychologist to develop a way that you can um, in improve how you apply for jobs, particularly jobs of high um, turnover. And they're finding that women are more likely to apply because they know they're going to get less bias because it's an AI. It's a really amazing turnaround. Uh, but it, it's, it's incredible how successful her software's been. And as well as um, looking at ways that we can electrify the world with AI augmented decision making. This is actually using machine learning and um, visualization to better improve using AI for our energy transition. And this is a ThoughtWorks project. So super exciting to see these um, these techniques being used to deliver much, much more empowerment in decision making. And another Melbourne company, I'll just really hammer it out, the Melbourne companies today is Archie Star. And so they started off by giving you the ability to just look at real estate and be able to see um, what planning overlays were on that specific real estate. And they've gone one step further now, so you can look at the planning overlay, but it will also generate for you buildings that are in line with that planning overlay, so you know what's possible to build on that, on that real estate. And this is super exciting, especially for our housing crisis and the kind of slowness there is in getting all these plans through. So um, amazing to see that kind of work happening with generative AI and, and um, architecture. So... I'm going to be closing soon. I haven't seen any of my five minutes come up, so I've got a bit of time, have I? <laughs> okay. Six minutes. All right. Um, I just wanted to mention that, you know, there is a changing consumer expectation of what's going on in our technical world, in our technological world. And so you'll see that director's duties have become much more significant around these areas, around privacy, cybersecurity, consumer protection, anti-discrimination, work health and safety. And you'll start to see as well that um, AI will be very similar to the way we do ESG. So things like diversity, inclusion, race and gender comes into the S. And so that's going to be part of where AI sits as well. The governance and how you do that risk mitigation, etc. And what you're doing for the environment as well. It's great, it's great to see it kind of fit into the normal board structure. And I also wanted to mention that um, this is the standard that's coming out. I love it because it kind of really talked to me about my user experience world and how you kind of get your data ready, how you reevaluate it, how you put it into operation, how you conti continuously evaluate it, how you design and develop it, how you test it, and, and how you deploy it. And this standard's coming out in November, and it's going to make it super exciting for people that really want to, um, you know, look beyond um, what they're doing with AI today and be able to have, have a way of being able to make sure that you're using it in a responsible way. 
Um, I was also super excited to see this study come out. And what's really interesting about this study is on this blue part of the graph is where the CEO is actually responsible for the AI strategy. So you'll find in that blue part of the graph is that they're getting a much stronger maturity and much better results in their responsible AI area. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, back in the days in my world in digital, it was always like senior managers going, let's just talk to the IT people. But I think it's not about that anymore. It's about senior managers getting involved and wanting to be part of the journey and, and be involved in that strategy. And when they are, the solutions are better. So there's nothing to lose there. Um, Okay, uh, I wanted to close by just saying that, you know, responsible AI is a practice we need to exercise. We're all learning, and it, it's something that, we know, we've really got to build a muscle around it. But this is how we can take advantage of many of the possibilities of the AI wave. So being able to exercise this muscle really helps you to take it to the next level. I wanted to thank ThoughtWorks for inviting me here today. It's super exciting to be able to spread the word about what we're doing and share stories and find out what you think. I can't wait to hear your questions as well. Um, if you want to know more about what we're doing, we actually have Australia's first AI month coming up. I know you thought it was about Melbourne Cup and Christmas, but no, it's about AI this year. From November the 15th to December the 15th, we're going to be having events all around Australia. Um, we can come and touch and feel, be involved, all the different types of personas, um, all that kind of stuff. So stay tuned. And also, if you want to follow um, the response, you want to join the Responsible AI Network, you can sign up at csiro.au slash National AI Centre. You can follow me on LinkedIn. You can join the conversation. You can connect with Australia's AI industry. So that's all from me. Thanks, Rita. Please join me in thanking Rita for the insights you shared with us this morning. Thank you so much. Do you want to um, have a seat over here? Let's have a chat. Because there's some... Um, yeah, that'd be great. Have a seat. Have a seat. So we've got Slido, as you know, available. So if you'd like to, to ask Rita a question in this time, please pop it up on Slido. We'll be um, organising them and popping them up here for me, for me to, um, to share those with Rita. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that on YouTube, we're streaming this, and Dave Coles, who's a director in our data and AI space, is manning that stream, ready to answer any curly questions that you may have. So feel free to, to pop those in if you're either in the room or also online. Um, something that um, I wanted to just touch on was this, the question that we raised earlier in the session, where we asked about who should be responsible for the control. And what you saw on the previous slide just then was that, by and large, actually in the majority, most people are expecting the government to move in this way, which, you know, in terms of your presentation, you're actually called out and, you know, we've got the standards coming through, we've got lots of work being done by the government on that. The reality, though, for most of us here and most of us online is that we can't really wait. Mm. We need to make some steps forward. We need to keep moving. We need to keep progressing our organisations. And one of the things I wanted to ask you was, what, what do you see as a no-regrets move that organisations can, can, can be taking, particularly in regard to generative AI? Because there's so many things, like, it was really, like, the, the volume of work that Reddy shared with us today is actually quite astounding when you see it all put together like that. So thank you for putting that together and sharing it with us. But there's so many options that we have, isn't there? And I wondered, of all of the things that organisations could be leaning into, what are some no-regrets things that, they can be, that organisations can be, can be working in? I think there's definitely no regret in sitting down and trying to figure out how you can use AI in your organisation and look at your AI strategy and like try and tap into those low hanging fruit areas where, and I think you know, we've seen already in the studies that the big areas are people like really helping people to find data. Like it's still a nightmare like to find stuff. And so how do we improve that and make that easier and you know, so that's been a really big, we've seen that knowledge workers, you know, helping them find information is like a really big thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that could be the no regrets one. But I also think it's also about, 
you know, really understanding where are the areas that you could innovate, um, it, you know, improve your productivity, but also innovate your product as well. So, you know, I, I, I find that Archie style people really fascinating. I mean, who would have thought you'd want to generate architecture? But in the way that they're doing it is so kind of novel. Mm. So to kind of think about, you know, what, what's possible in your organisation. Is... So it really, it's about being very specific to the to the products, to the customers that you've got, to the information needs that they have, and trying to address those. Yeah, yeah. I think it's it's very. I, I really think it's very similar to what we used to do in the digital day, where we kind of sit down and go, okay how do we improve our customer experience and like where are the things that they're finding challenging and how can we make that better and you know those, those kind of areas and I think that they're areas for major improvement that you know people are dying for. It's actually really reassuring because that, these are the things that we know how to do. We know how to identify pain points, we know how to work on those pain points. This can be seen as a way to keep improving that. So let's go to the Slido questions now and uh, here we go. Let's look up here. Can you see them up there? Uh, compared to other countries, do you think Australia is behind in the AI race? Where do you see that? I think we are. Um, we're actually quite lower adopters of AI than most other countries. I think we're like number 15. And I've got, you'll find there's some reports where you can download it on, on the NAIC website. But I think it's, it's a um, societal thing as well. I think we have a lot of fear of... Um, computer vision and, you know, like I saw an article in The Age just yesterday about the 70 cameras that are in every supermarket that are watching us. And I'm like, but are they watching us? Like, are they just helping us at the checkout? Are they just making sure that we don't, you know, there's no one fallen over? And, you know, are they actually chasing our facial recognition? Maybe they're not. And I think you'll find that a lot of organisations have this privacy in place where they're not actually storing your facial data. But I think that there is a lot of that fear in, in Australia. Um, and I think there's a lot of fear that, you know, the robots are going to take over. So I think it, it's a really interesting thing to try and break that down and, um, you know, improve. And I think it's not just about business. It's also about society and um, making people less scared about AI as well. Mm. I saw one of the questions pop up. It's interesting that you talk about the fear because um, one of the questions was about fear. And um, here we go. There's one at the top there. I'm a doubter. I feel like we need to solve for the biases that are all over AI before we jump in and use it as a force for change. And in terms of ultimately responsible, you know, we, we talked to that question at the start, the Slido question, which was about the government having a strong position there, but about all of us actually probably feeling accountable for our part in that and becoming aware and... Um, responsible for, for what we're doing to contribute but, to that. But I think that's a really interesting point. There is so much bias in data, mm. um, but there is even without AI. Like, you know, I've spent my life in male-dominated industries, and I'm telling you, didn't need AI for them to be biased towards me. So, <laughs> like, trust me, there's plenty of bias without AI. So, but what AI allows us to do it is clean it out a bit and like be able to identify it and actually be able to manage and control it a lot mm. a lot more differently than if we don't know it's happening type mm. thing. Mm. So I think the bias is something that we can actually reduce. So one of the questions up here at the top, and there was another one earlier, it was about business and executives particularly to, to have the mindset to be able to adopt and introduce AI. You've talked a little bit uh, about fear. You've talked a bit about Australia being a bit behind. So what do you think can be done to help industry leaders, organisational leaders, to, to understand the fear, perhaps, to recognise it, to lean into the opportunity? Um, I do think it is education and opening it up and talking to executives in a way that's not bamboozling mm. and, and I think that's really important because I think when I first learnt about data science you know I went to a data science event and it was like a whole lot of data scientists and they were all trying to predict who was going to win the soccer right and there was lots of technical information and I thought well no executive's going to get into this right but I think as as it becomes more um more relevant to business then I think it's and it's making it relevant to business that I think is really important to have those conversations to like detect the conversations and talk about the benefits and, and the kind of things that are possible mm -hmm. and it was really interesting I did a presentation for um, 
a wine company last week and they had their very senior executives and I did a bit of research and looked at some of the AI companies that they were invest that they were using and most of the executives didn't even know they were using AI in their organization. Yeah. So I thought that was just fascinating that, you know, there is AI in your organization and as an exec you probably don't even know. Um, so it's about kind of lifting, you know, your ideas around that. So Yeah, and lifting the visibility and also the the piece in the data about people using it and not necessarily telling people about it, that there's something there about making it safe to explore and encouraging people to explore, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 AI has the potential to revolutionise how we live. With the doomsday narrative of AI, there's a risk of AI being overregulated, which slows the development of AI. Do you see governments will struggle to find the right balance? Um, I think regulation is a difficult topic for me, not one I am, you know, uh, able to talk about in a lot of detail. But I do know that um, governments don't want to create this, um, you know, having to regulate a brand new industry. So there's a lot of flow through in yeah. terms of, you know, people like Standards Australia who are doing that, or, you know, a lot of the laws around privacy and security that already exist and making them relevant to AI, um, and a lot of other kind of existing stuff that you, you kind of create that relevance. So I think, um, so I think the question was around regulation. I think um, your point about where Australia is in the global standing of adoption of AI is probably material to this. There's a lot that the regulators will be learning and watching overseas, particularly as they advance, and it'll be a fast follow case, I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, we don't necessarily have to do what Europe's done, or like, yeah. you know, there'll be different techniques that'll be used. Yeah, absolutely. How are we going for time? Are we good still? Yeah. Two more questions. Two more questions, please. Thank you. I can see that um, there's lots of... The, what I said before about um, Panacea versus Pandora's box is really coming out in the questions, isn't it? There's a lot of um, uncertainty, I guess. Um, how do we prevent AI being used to take unfair shortcuts? For example, with students using it to get assignments done? It's a really interesting question. How did people think that um, students coped when we first got calculators? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Gen AI is the best tutor you could ever ask for. You can ask it anything. And um, I think it's really interesting, like in South Australia, they've just launched um, a a generative AI platform that's specific for students. So they've taken, they've, you know, done, made it a bit safer, taken out some of the toxic stuff, and they're doing a trial, um, and, and they're finding it super exciting, the benefits that the kids are getting. Um, I think the last thing you want to do is stop kids from having access to their own personalised tutor. Uh, and, and I think it's, it's going to make a really big difference to their education to be able to um, have that natural language ability to ask questions. And, and the, the future of personalised education is mm. so real. But I still think you still need the classrooms and the interaction and the people but you'll, you'll probably just have these better tools that you can use, like a better calculator. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think it's super exciting for, for kids to, to have access to that technology. I actually heard of an example in higher ed where, the, where you know, this was happening, where the students were using AI to submit um, and improve their results, and the staff started to use AI to assess them, and, and they used AI to understand who was making the same mistake, which would tell them which one was using the AI, and so weed out some of the, the usages of it there, or at least identify it. So it's being used on both sides of the equation. Absolutely. We all know how much lecturers and teachers hate marking assignments. So <laughs> anything to make their life easier. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's super challenging, I agree. I want to explore a little bit more about um, some of the challenges that you see in organisations and different industries in adoption of it. It, it takes a lot of investment. It takes a lot of co competency internally in organisations and capabilities. Where do you see organisations being most successful in investing to 
get future ready, really, in terms of the skills and capabilities, either in their product or technology teams, to be able to capitalise on AI? Yeah, so some of the low-hanging fruit around that is around the customer service and, like, making it easier for people to access um, information about the products and services. Um, it's in, you know, improving the way employees can find out data about it. It's really big in the whole cyber security space as yeah. well yeah. Um, in terms of, and I think you would have noticed that I talked about the scammers. So that's a really big area that people are using AI. And I think it's in this... Um, you know, new stuff that's going to happen around the way we understand data and the way we're able to visualise data and the whole digital twin world as well and how you can take it into that environment. So there's this journey around, you know, looking at the simple things you can do and then looking at the more um, advanced stuff and then looking at the whole transformation that you might do in your organisation as yeah, well. absolutely. So I th it's, it's a bit of a journey. But, um, but I also think... As I was saying, it's, it's quite interesting how much you can actually, you know, use products that might be suiting exactly what you're doing, like a HR product or, um, you know, a, a, a different type of um, solution. So it doesn't all have to be homegrown in your organisation mm. as well. Um, so it's, and I think that's where the ecosystem portal is super interesting to yeah. be able to pick up and learn a bit more about it that way as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's all we have time for. Um, thank you so much again, Rita. It's a pleasure. Please join me in, in thanking Rita. <laughs> you can relax now. High five. <laughs>